welcome to Shadow of the Cast, a Marvel Champions podcast. I'm Villain Fury, and I'm here with Nelson. Nelson, what are we talking about on today's episode? Today, we are diving all the way back to the beginning, the roots of the game, and we're going to be revisiting the Avengers, the Avenger tribe. We're going to come, kind of talk about how they have developed with the more recent card pools and seeing if they're still viable today. We're going to also, this is coming out kind of in that Halloween spooky season, so we're going to talk about some of our favorite Halloween scenarios, give some recommendations there, and then we're going to answer some community questions. A reminder, if you have questions that you want us to discuss or talk about, you can email us at shadowofthecast at gmail.com or comment on the YouTube video below, and we will get to those in a future episode. But you have been playing some Avengers and we we kind of break it, broken these up into some subcategories. We'll see how loosely we actually stick to those or how how tightly we stick to those. But I think what you are, at least from what I understand, excited to talk about is Spectrum, which is in that aerial category. So tell me about Spectrum. Yeah, so Spectrum is a character that I think has been quite polarizing in the community since she came out. I think some people really like her. And a lot of people find her really frustrating, you know, it's stuck in the wrong form, that kind of thing. But what I think has been interesting lately is on the last episode, we covered Angel. And Angel came with a lot of new aerial cards. And Spectrum is, I think, technically the only other character that starts with aerial in the game. Although Thor and Nova get very easy access, basically, on turn one. But, you know, Spectrum also has aerial printed on her uh, identity card. And... I've really been enjoying Spectrum again. I've been playing her through a campaign alongside my friend who's been playing Psylocke. And what's interesting about both of these characters is they can both get to free forwarding or free, you know, basic attack, uh, you know, naturally, but if in very different ways. So it's been interesting to compare them side by side because to me, Spectrum's always been a very strong hero. Not top, top tier, but definitely very formidable. But I will say Psylocke has given Spectrum quite the run for her money in <laughs> my experience. Um, so far, but I have really been enjoying Spectrum. I've been trying her with the new aerial cards, and so I haven't been loving the new aerial allies. They're just fine. I haven't been loving aerial intervention for her. I think it's good. Her signature ally is actually uh, an aerial character as well. So aerial intervention is one of the new cards. That means you have to exhaust an aerial character, and then you can reduce the damage you're taking by three. That's been fine. But what I've really enjoyed her with is the new Soaring Acrobatics upgrade, which lets you add plus one to a stat. Even if Spectrum has perhaps been in the wrong form, then she needs to be able to still get two out of a different stat by using it, or really, you know, heavily lean into the stat I'm in and get, you know, four attack or four forwarding or, you know, four defense. So that has been really fun. So I don't think that's been a dramatic change for her. And I would say I don't think any of the new side schemes have been, you know, dramatically influential but she does have a good amount of thwarting so she's pretty good at hitting those nice yeah spectrum is like you were saying polarizing and i was on one side of the polarization where i did not enjoy spectrum and then recently probably about six months ago or so i started playing more of her and i've been enjoying her more than i remembered but i don't have a ton of experience with spectrum and i would be interested in revisiting her with kind of the the new cards that we got in that angel pack um i'm 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 especially thinking about like aerial intervention or not uh, you just said aerial intervention uh what's the uh what's the leadership card that we just got the the four cost leadership we get to ready a ton of aerial it's either called flight formation or flying formation and flying formation yeah that sounds right i think that would be really interesting because she has those huge stats so if you're running her in a multiplayer game you're running her in justice. She can clear a significant amount of threat, but then you can ready her up with if someone else is running the leadership, the the flying formation, ready her up and get multiple uses out of those um, stats. I'm curious if you have used any of those flying formation cards to try and just double up on her, you know, huge stat line. I have used that card, but not for Spectrum yet, so I don't have a lot of meaningful input there. But I think it could be really fun to do a, you know, aerial character team up, you know, maybe bring an Angel, as oh, another, yeah, you know, bring fun. in four, and I think that could be really fun. Yeah. Spe yeah, so I, I want to transition to the next kind of subcategory of our uh, heroes here. Speaking of readies, we have a couple of characters in that first, uh, first wave. I guess they are, they're not both from the first wave, but from the event. 
Avengers tribe, the, what we're deeming the Red Ears, Captain America and Quicksilver. These are characters that easily get access to ready or Captain America can, I can do this all day, discard a card, stand up, and Quicksilver just after a basic action gets to ready. And these have been a couple of characters that I've really enjoyed revisiting, especially from like the Psylocke pack with Float Like a Butterfly, where you get, uh, you get to deal extra damage to confused enemies. And I especially like this with Captain America, who likes to go down to Alter Ego to get out those allies. And there's a really nice synergy there because Float Like a Butterfly allows you to um, deal one extra damage from any character that attacks that includes your allies. And Captain America on his Steve Rogers side allows you to reduce the next ally you play by one. And so you're able to flip down. That villain is probably confused if you're leaning into that float strategy. And when you're down, you get to then put out more allies, which then get better benefits against that confused enemy. And I've I've been really like interested in that because I think that Cap has some fairly good like thwarting power already. And so we can take that confuse power move it into um kind of almost damage output with float like a butterfly i have built a quicksilver deck but i have not been able to play the float like a butterfly and that's just kind of where my mind went when like we're we're thinking about like these red ears i was like well float is the thing that's been on my mind recently and so i'm curious i'm curious if there's anything that has sparked your interest from these red ears from newer packs yeah so Interesting you talk about Float Like a Butterfly from Psylocke because a card I've liked with them, and this is Quicksilver specifically, I've not actually played a lot of Captain America too recently, but for Quicksilver is upside the head because he can Ooh, run up nice. so much. He's, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to throw just one attack out on the villain. So yeah. you can then trigger, you know, the condition for upside the head, which, you know, it's a new one cost card. When you're making a basic attack, you know, you can get a confuse off on the villain. And... Although Quicksilver is one of his advantages is he can defend in the villain phase. If you then you know, have to save that confused to get Alter Ego, you can start to use his ability there you know, a little bit more easily than most decks. Then you get to cycle through for more readies. And if you're also running Float Like a Butterfly, you know, maybe you can get some extra readies to use that. So I think that's really fun. Um, something else for Quicksilver I feel like I have to mention is the superpower training player side scheme for friction resistance. Yeah. That is... Uh, I think that will always be known as one of the classic combos with superpower training. You know, however many heroes they add into the game, that's always going to be really good. Um, yeah. But the main and oh, I, on, I think, yeah. Yeah. No, I think I think superpower training has a lot of impact for some of these earlier heroes because there are those key upgrades with some of the the heroes. I'm Ant Man, Quicksilver. That are completely different plays the, the gameplay is completely different if you get that out turn one versus if it's your your bottom decking that and so with superpower training it just gives you another kind of avenue to get that key upgrade and so i think we're gonna see a reoccurring theme with superpower training specifically for some of these older heroes whereas like i think a lot of the newer heroes there's easier ways to get those key pieces the designers have kind of realized like oh okay like put it in a setup or maybe give them an action Whereas like Nova, you're able to tutor your helmet by spending a resource, stuff like that. Easy access to those key upgrades. But I think superpower training is going to be something that we revisit fairly frequently here. But I mean, friction resistance is so nice. I think Yarm Yorn, Yarm Jorn, I'm never going to be able to say it right. But that, <laughs> that, came, <laughs> that came in, uh, was that the Valkyrie pack? Or was that? That was with was that Thor. Thor. That was with Thor. Okay, so... I guess it's it's not revisiting if it's in the same wave, but <laughs> I, uh, I don't know. I, I I I I need to say that that is a fun combo with friction resistance. I I I have to say that every I'm I'm contractually obligated to say that every time we talk about uh, Quicksilver. <laughs> what I'm contractually obligated to talk about with Quicksilver, which is the last probably big point I would personally want to hit on here, but I want to say that Quicksilver with repurpose has been a big favorite of mine. Mm, uh, we played a quicksilver team up with star lord i think that's fun what about captain america is i mean captain america was is considered one of the better heroes in the game has he gotten a boost has he kind of been normalized one with uh with some of these newer packs newer heroes what, what are your thoughts around cap well that's a great question you know when i released my tier list video you know a couple months ago now people not a lot of people but a couple of people were upset with how and i say you know how low I put him, but he was still in the top 10 for me. So 
I think he was considered for a long time like the second strongest character in the game, or you know, top three, top four, however you want to say it. For me, I think he has stayed very powerful, but I think he has been a little bit outpaced by newer additions or some, you know, almost equally, you know, older heroes who utilize new cards in a better way. So I always considered Cap stronger than Captain Marvel. But I think whereas Captain Marvel's strength is card draw and resources, she can use the new cards more, you know, get them into her hand and pay for them more. Whereas Captain America doesn't have that. So I think Captain America stayed really strong, but he has slipped down a little bit comparatively. But, you know, if someone's top 10 or almost top 10, they're in a very good spot still. So, yeah, take yeah. that as you will. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, totally fair. Speaking of some of the stronger heroes in the game, Doctor Strange, is is he still good? I mean, they, they nerfed Cosmo pretty hard. Is he still okay? Uh, he's definitely like i don't know f tier disgusting garbage <laughs> character um, no he's still really good the cosmo nerf is really interesting if you're not aware and this is really quite a minor thing but they when they released the 1.5 rules reference the new rules we got which are really well written by the way one of the changes they brought in with that that effect and you know they only did this for one or two cards really but they took cosmo and i said he breaks things you know being able to discard a card from any deck. Um, I don't want to say I was personally responsible for this, but I definitely wrote in a question saying, how does Cosmo work with Storm's Weather deck? And, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, so Cosmo now can only target player, like proper player decks with your normal, you know, cards, your decks you built, or the villains in counter deck. You know, it can't target side decks or extra decks. So now Doctor Strange cannot cycle the Invocation deck with Cosmo. Which in some ways is quite a big, you know, nerf. It's weakened, you know, that interaction quite a bit. But I will say, I feel like Cosmo for Doctor Strange was very good, but not, you know, essential. You know, if you landed on a good invocation anyway, you're still having a good time. It is a little bit unfortunate, you know, I say this relatively, you know, compared to what he was, you know, that he now only has one ally that can kind of cycle the invocation deck. You know, Wong is the signature ally which does that. But he still has everything really it's just slightly less convenient but he for me, for my in my opinion he is still the top most powerful character in most situations yeah i think i think he's still really strong and while we only have wong that can cycle that deck we have gotten a couple of new cards especially in the protection aspect which is kind of added that archetype of readying which is kind of what doctor strange needs to do in order to pay the cost of his invocation cards is exhaust himself so cards like ever vigilant he can get that aerial trait with his cape now i always think warlock needs it whenever he plays his cape but it's, it's strange gets aerial with his cape so you can ready up and play more invocation cards what doesn't kill me is another card that allows you to stand up play more invocation cards so i think that doctor strange was really good when he came out and even with the Cosmo nerf, I think he's better now because the way that I think about Doctor Strange is I just kind of ignore a lot of his cards and just focus on that invocation deck. And any cards that allow me to play more of those seem really good. So, yeah, I think I think some of those always ready kind of cards uh, have really, really benefited the uh, the Sorcerer Supreme. Oh, I guess not anymore. Is that a spoiler? <laughs> you know... <laughs> What's interesting is he can get aerial from that cape. Maybe he would like that, you know, flying formation card for the yeah, for the ready. <laughs> that that would be interesting. I mean, we all know that Doctor Strange's probably best aspect is leadership. And so that would be really interesting to see if he wants to be able to pay for that flying formation card. Interesting. Yeah. I, I I'm curious if anyone any of the listeners have tried a aerial deck with Doctor Strange, because that's a combo that I haven't really thought about too, too much, but it feels like it could be kind of interesting and powerful, especially with the Flying Formation. Hmm. What's interesting, Flying Formation is really expensive, but now that I think about it, one of the weaknesses of Flying Formation is if you ready up a hero and it's not on their turn, you know, they might not be able to benefit from it if they've already had their turn. But Doctor Strange can exhaust himself with an action on his hero card, so he can actually mm. always... So that's actually really interesting. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, let let us know. Let us know if you tried a Doctor Strange aerial deck. But Flying Formation seems to be... I feel like... I, y'all y'all can't see them, but I can see the uh, Gears and Villains brain turning right now, trying to build some decks. <laughs> so. I'm interested. I, I'm definitely interested. But we're going to have to focus back on the Avengers. I think it might be time to move on. And we've talked about Captain America and Doctor Strange, who I think are typically considered maybe the strongest. Uh, Avengers, or definitely among the strongest. 
And I think it's time we move back toward the other end of the spectrum. Not spectrum, but you know. <laughs> this category I have called uh, <laughs> bruisers, which means kind of high health and high attack. And that's sort of kind of about it. Those characters have, in general, I think, received quite a lot of support. So what do you think of those kind of characters? And I'm talking, you know, Hulk, Thor, all that kind of thing. What do you think about that, Nelson? I, I think that they have gotten more fun. I, I, don't, I do think that they've gotten a nice little boost. And I think the only one in this pack that does not benefit from all the cards that we got in the SPDR, the Spider Pack, which would be like Limitless Stamina and Unshakable. I always get Unshakable and Unflappable confused in my head, but Unshakable, where you can only play these cards if you have a printed health pool of 14 or more, which applies to She-Hulk, Hulk, Thor, but not Valkyrie, because Valkyrie can never have anything nice. Um, those, I think, are a huge boost, because especially with like Hulk and Thor... And I don't think She-Hulk has that, that many superpowers in her kit, if I'm remembering correctly. One or two. One or two. Yeah, but we got Death Focus and Galaxy's Most Wanted, and so we can have that cheap resource generator, which can pay for Limitless Stamina and Unshakable, allowing us to ready up. Because another one of the similarities in these bruisers is that they typically have really high attack. So She-Hulk, Hulk, Thor all have three attack Thor gets that three attack with his setup ability. But if we have a really cheap way to ready, we can access that three attack even more. And we don't have a ton of threat reduction options inside the kit, but I do think that the aspects themselves, justice included, but kind of focusing on aspects outside of justice, have gotten better at threat reduction. So we have cards in aggression some of our allies have access to confuse i'm thinking psylocke and so we have the ability to confuse to prevent that unneeded advance or unwanted advance and stuff like that so i think that those spider was a huge benefit to those um characters i think valkyrie is still still a sad case i i don't think that i'm curious ha have you found any benefit or any any recent cards that have helped valkyrie out because i i really don't think that she's getting that much love yes and no so there's a card that's kind of benefited i would say almost every hero but the higher hp heroes benefit more from it so this includes you know she hulk hulk for um and that is clarity of purpose and valkyrie oh, nice, yeah. really suffers from resource generation some of her cards you know they're not really that bad but She's just trying to do a lot of different things and she cannot afford it whatsoever. So I definitely found that helps her a lot. Um, but nothing significantly, you know, I think, wow, this is really good specifically for Valkyrie. Nothing like that has to, you know, really struck me in that regard yet. I do think lock and load to new aggression side scheme, being able to find mm -hmm. her sword makes a big difference, but she's not very good at fording. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> there is a, you know, a little catch to that, but... Yeah, Val Valkyrie has gotten better in the sense that if you bring a high fort friend to the table with Valkyrie, she can benefit from those player side schemes with lock and load, uh, superpower training again, and then just a couple other. I guess Valkyrie is also another hero that we can get Ariel with. So it's still, it's still just it's a tough. It's yeah. Val Valkyrie <laughs> Valkyrie and True Solo is a is a it's a tough look. Um, but one of the things that I've really enjoyed with some of these higher health heroes is playing around with one of the new cards that we got in Angel's Pack, which is Taunt. Taunt is, I think, the, the protection rebalanced version of one way or another, where the villain attacks you, and then no character other than, no character, no other character can help defend for the attack, and you get to draw three cards. It costs one. And so Taunt works because with like Hulk, or Thor or She-Hulk and, and Valkyrie to some extent because taking that villain attack in most scenarios, especially at the beginning where you're kind of building and Taunt helps you do that, allows you to um, kind of take that on the chin, use that high health for kind of as a resource and draw some cards. But what are, what are your thoughts around Taunt with some of these new characters? Or old characters, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I have not actually been able to try Taunt with these characters specifically yet, but I think what you're saying there makes a lot of sense. I have thought about it with Hulk in particular, and also She-Hulk. I think what's interesting about these characters is they all tend to have 
pretty good recovery stats as well. So even in a longer game, you know, maybe a multiplayer game, you could take a hit, mm -hmm. you know, and rather than, you know, defend or, you know, anything like that, and just head ultra ego and, you know, recover, maybe with downtime for like seven or something. You know, it's going to kind of yeah. outpace what the villain is doing to you in that regard. Uh, and you get all these resources. And like you say, I think early game, as you were mentioning, getting that tempo to start help set up, it's going to really help these characters a lot. She-Hulk is interesting. I actually just looked it up. She has five um, superpower cards, but two of them are Ground Stomp, so <laughs> kind, of she, kind of she has three. <laughs> she has three. Um, she has three cards, yeah. She-Hulk is actually um, a character I wouldn't mind talking more about. She is a character that also benefited from the 1.5 uh, rules reference. Uh, yeah. She now, because of the way uh, the targeting rules work, you know, must have a valid target. That you know, if the enemy is stalwart or you know they're already stunned, the stun from her uh, super strength uh, upgrade means that you cannot stun them. So you know you can't even try to, which means it doesn't fall off the character. So you can just do these humongously powerful attacks, taking out minions or <laughs> smashing into the villain, and you can build up a really high attack stat. You know, I think getting seven attack is not is is very doable, and I have enjoyed that a lot. I've played that a couple more times recently. I've been having a lot of fun. Yeah, I remember I was I was in the airport about to board a plane, and we were trying to figure out this new ruling with the one point five. How does it interact with like stalwart, or if you kill the minion, do do you have to get rid of that? Uh, whereas a force response to discard, she all can be a really really strong minion slayer. She can take out some of these huge minions if you're taking it on. Like, are you if you're facing off against a stalwart villain? or a villain that is already stunned and you have like someone that stat you, you're playing her alongside captain america who's so good at stunning villains you can get some really really powerful attacks out <laughs> and then you run her in like quick strike which is valkyrie so kind of kind of in that same tribal that we're talking about right now but the ability to get her stats really high and then find ways to exploit that with other cards has also just been a really fun play style that she's benefited from since that core set. Yeah, it's so good. And it's growing on me more and more. I do think in one regard, it's only taking something that was already a strength and making even more of a strength, but it's making it so <laughs> strong. Um, I think I think it was this podcast, unless it was another video or something we did, but I'm pretty sure it was with you, Nelson. I was talking about how I had a game where I think I was She-Hulk and can't remember who the other player was playing. But basically, they got attacked. Uh, they decided, yeah, I'd just risk it. But it was ended up being max damage. They were down to one hit point. But then the encounter card was there being attacked. I had to defend them with She-Hulk, you know. Yeah. And we were in. I was down to one HP as well. We we're both at one hit point, and you know, we desperately had to win now or never. I was, <laughs> I was fishing for. Um, I had split personality. I was fishing to try and find Gamma Slam, you know, to do the classic, you know, Gamma Slam. If you, you aren't aware, is a card that. Uh, does damage kind of equal to the amount of health you're missing so you know you can do it to 15 damage with it and i was looking for that to try and you know find a way to end the game because now now i'm an exhausted she hulk uh but i didn't find it but in the end i found so many ways to ready and i had both my superpower <laughs> strength things uh, i had I, I ended up still managing to find like 32 damage despite starting as exhausted <laughs> um, that's amazing so yeah oh, we geez. managed to pull that game out so that was uh she hulks definitely moved up a little bit in my estimation, we can say that, so that's been really yeah. fun. That's interesting. One of the common threads through some of these bruisers kind of transition into another subcategory that we have, and these are like the low or one thwart heroes. A lot of the bruisers don't have great threat mitigation in their kit, and we can kind of also talk about Hawkeye and War Machine here, where they have that one thwart, they have, you know, better stats elsewhere, but they also have lower thwarting in their kit. And thwarting is really, really powerful and necessary in Marvel Champions. And so some of these I know are at least Hawkeye and War Machine are in the bottom tier of my tier list just because of how little thwart they have. And I, I'm, I'm coming at this from mainly a true solo perspective because if you have someone at the table who can help with the threat, then, you know, you can lean in and do kind of what you need to be doing. Whereas you, you may want to help out here and there if you want to be a good teammate, but there are new ways to help with threat. But I still think that Hawkeye and War Machine, if they they need to find a way to manage threat or they need to find a way to win before that becomes an issue. 
what are what what are your thoughts around how Hawkeye and War Machine have grown since that their initial printing? So both heroes have definitely grown to some degree. I do think perhaps Hawkeye has actually grown less. And Hawkeye's problem is he's got, you know, one defense and nine hit points. <laughs> and they started introducing a lot of steady in Star Wars, so all his stuns and confused are now worth <laughs> a lot less. Um the things I feel like they brought in to maybe punish, you know, Doctor Strange ended up hitting Hawkeye a lot harder than they ever hit Doctor Strange, in my opinion. So that's a little bit unfortunate. But he's also a, quite low on threat removal, as we sort of touched on. And I do think a lot of new cards have helped that. You know, Deadpool is an ally that I don't think has been talked about too much because we've got, you know, flashy new side schemes, a lot of new heroes. But Deadpool is, you know, really good for, you know, potentially continuous threat removal. I think that's really helpful. And... I want to make sure I credit this to the right person. I think they are called, their username is Man is Obsolete. He posted a really cool Hawkeye deck, which uses the new Domino ally, which swaps a card from your hand with the top of your deck. So you can swap an arrow onto the top of your deck and then use your quiver mm. to definitely oh, find cool. an arrow. And that is so good. I've not had a chance to play that yet, but that's been on my list. I think that's really, really cool. So he's got some new stuff in that regard, but I'd say he still has the same weaknesses. They're not super you know, accounted for. He's not doing anything crazy that new heroes can't. So though he's not as low on my list as you have him, while he's a lot better in multiplayer, the way that, you know, all his signature cards only really pay for or interact with arrows can kind of, you know, be a little bit limiting. If you don't find an arrow, you have a problem. But if you do find an arrow, you know, it's not really tying into the rest of what you put into the deck too closely. So he's he's better, but, you know, regarding, you know, a tier list, I don't think he's particularly moved up. He's risen as all heroes have risen, you know. Hawkeye today is a lot stronger than Hawkeye, you know, a year or two ago. But yeah. he's, he's still Hawkeye. War Machine, all I'm going to mention is shoulder cannon and float like a butterfly. <laughs> that's a that's a really fun combo because while he gets ripped apart by Retaliate, now he can rip apart multiple villains because you're doubling that efficiency of shoulder cannon, which is really powerful. The other thing that I've really enjoyed with Hawkeye to some extent, War Machine to a larger extent, and pretty much everybody with low threat in their kit is Professor X, who's a new basic ally, three cost, comes in. I think he has a couple of options, but I typically am always choosing Confuse the Villain. You can also Sun a Minion already in our X-Men character, but that Confuse is so good. When you get a three thwart, a chump block, that to me has really elevated um, some of these heroes that need to flip and have low thwarting like War Machine because now you can confuse, you can flip down, get your ammo counters back, come right back up and just be ready to go. He can also help with the like Hawkeye, not necessarily for the confuse. Clint doesn't have a huge reason to want to go to Alter Ego, but he does have one defense and nine health. So he is a chump blocker because he's get, Professor X is getting discarded at the end of the round regardless. So might as well throw him in front of that villain. Uh, you know, wheel him out in front of the villain attack, as I, I've heard said, and let him take that hit. And so with that can help supplement a lot of the lower thwart heroes. I run Professor X in a lot of my decks now just because Confuse is so powerful. And, I mean, he's going to help Captain America. He's going to help Quicksilver. He's going to help Scarlet Witch. He's going to help all of these really powerful heroes, but he also really, really helps the lower-tier heroes as well. Yeah, Professor X. We mentioned him a little bit in the previous episode. Even if you don't benefit from, let's say, his Confuse or him blocking or something, he's just so well-custed that you're probably still yeah. going to play him in a lot of situations. And for solo play, which is, you know, I play it a bit, you play it, you know, mainly is what you play. Yeah, Professor X, such a powerful card. Good for everyone, but those characters, um, you know, both the low forwarding heroes, but also the heroes that want to, you know, flip Alter Ego really often has been a massive, massive benefit. And War Machine, you know, fits both of those categories, you know, to the extremes, you know. He's a character that really wants to go and get that ammo, but cannot deal with the threat on his own very well. And yeah. I think this might be a good time to transition to another character that likes to go Alter Ego. And we can talk about Black Widow. So tell me, Nelson, mm. what do you think about the new preparation cards we've been getting? Which ones? <laughs> you know, the new preparation cards. Uh, all, all of those new prep cards? There is one new one. There is we got one, one aerial one. one, right? The aerial yeah. one, Eyes in the Sky, is a just this card. Yeah. Zero <laughs> yeah. I, I want more prep cards. Black Widow has been a character that, as I've grown in the game, I've enjoyed her more because she's all about preparation cards, which are reactive rather than proactive. 
So the the villain attacks you, you get to cancel boost icons, or you reveal a treachery, cancel that. Those are really powerful effects that I when I start when I was starting out playing the game, that she was one of the new first heroes that I bought, and when I played her, I struggled massively with her because i just didn't understand the flow of the game so i do think that she has a skill kind of curve but once you are able to wrap your head around how the game works she can be so interesting and built so well i want more preparation cards i think that i've, I've said it before on my channel that one of my favorite things to do is take my turn during the villain's turn right you know defend draw cards deal damage i want to play that protection do activate things when i'm not supposed to be activating things type situation and black widow embodies that and with the prep cards that we got i think all the prep cards have come in her kit plus eyes in the sky right have we gotten any prep cards that are outside of that i think valkyrie who we keep keeps coming up came with anticipation Okay. And yeah. I think Wasp might have come with Lion Weight. Okay. But still right around that same time, Valkyrie was a little bit after. But I like I for some reason, like I, I want I, I wish that they would print more prep cards and I, I'm curious why we haven't seen any of those. Because there are like heroes that benefit off of these types of cards. Like Cyclops really likes tactics cards. We have skill cards now with Psylocke, and we have a lot of those. And I see us getting more tactics cards, and I will probably get more skill cards <laughs> if I was a betting man. I I would put money on that. And I want more prep cards because I think that that's a really interesting strategy to run, not just with Black Widow, but I do want more prep cards. So I'm not a hundred percent sure she has gotten a huge benefit um she 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 really kind of almost like struggles with some of the newer cards like dance of death is kind of that iconic three attacks and so all of these things that iterate on attack you only get to choose one of those so like aggressive energy where you're getting plus three with a royal flush with gambit you only get plus one do you not Aggressive energy actually works at all three of Dance of Death, but Warrior skill only works with Warrior. one. Yeah, some, okay, that's some, what I was some, thinking. Some of them work with the event, some of them only work with the attack, which is very confusing. Um, yes. But yeah, it's unfortunate that some don't work with Black Widow. The I last thing know. that I will say about Black Widow is the um, the same thing that we've kind of been saying with War Machine and a couple of these other like ready heroes is float like a butterfly because she wants to lean into that strategy. She wants to go down to uh, Alter Ego. She has confused in her kit and a multi-iteration attack in her kit. So Float Like a Butterfly is going to pay off for her as well. I have not tried that deck, but it's been one of those that's been floating in the back of my mind. I'm like, ooh, okay, let's revisit Black Widow, because I feel like she could be fun. But what are your thoughts? Any any cards that have jumped out to you that have really elevated Black Widow or you know made other heroes rise and her not? So uh, there's this little card called Clarity of Purpose, uh, <laughs> Professor X. <laughs> no, no, um, not specifically really. I mean, to some degree, I think her strongest build is rapid response, you know, cycling that because it's a preparation. So new allies have been interesting for her, but there's no real new strategy. There's nothing specific that I think has massively elevated her personally. But she is still, you know, perfectly, you know, she's strong enough. I do think in certain games she's she's a little bit low she's not very good at dealing with stuff but she's very good at preventing it from happening in the first place which is very interesting and i do agree i'd love to see more preparations you know both for her and for other heroes to use uh maybe maybe one day we get a winter soldier hero who comes with preparations maybe Ooh, that'd be cool that'd not, be really cool not my unique idea i definitely had that somewhere probably on discord or something but yeah, yeah. one day I live in hope. I genuinely just think they forgot that the preparation uh, trait kind of existed. Um, but yeah. it is what it is. Uh, that's fair. So I guess like I want to pick your brain because I have not built this deck, but I do think it would be kind of interesting is kind of visiting the shield stuff with Black Widow, which came out in the Sinister Motives. They've gotten a lot more rounding out of that trait. And Black Widow is a shield character. And so I'm curious if you've used anything and kind of built shield into Black Widow and how that's worked. Yeah, I think one of my first decks that actually got, you know, in any kind of way popular was a Black Widow shield deck. Um, so I've definitely dabbled with that. And it's interesting with the shield cards. Over time, I have come to kind of 
appreciate putting less of them in a deck, still building into it, but not as much as you maybe could. Just take what you need. But the unique interaction that Black Widow has, other than you know being you know shield traded, is that her uh, safe house uh, support card is shield traded, mm. so you can oh, use cool. uh, Agent Thirteen to ready that up, which has you know giving you more preparation than you could ever dream of has been <laughs> fun. And you know you could just ready up heavy carrier and you know have another resource that way, but. Safe House is cheaper to get into play. It's another target, and it's just really good. So I have enjoyed that. Um, I will say I think Black Widow is, as a character, slightly passive. She's more, more about preventing things. I think Shield mm. is also a little bit more of a passive kind of um, trait. So I definitely think it maybe shines brighter in multiplayer, where someone else can maybe bring the aggression. But I do, I do think it's good. I do think it's fun. Yeah. So my favorite shield character, we can transition into Spider Woman now. That's my favorite character to play shield with because she can take aspects from both or take cards from two aspects. And so now you can take your justice shield cards as well as like leadership skill cards is usually what I'm leaning into and being able to ready Asian 13 with like command teams, which are I think also shield, but like you can kind of iterate and get more use out of there but we kind of lumped spider woman and spider man together as like web warriors and they're not web warriors uh, but they have <laughs> spider in the title so they can get web warrior with warrior the great web but spider woman i've really enjoyed the shield trait with her um she like one of my one of my run throughs of sinister motives i ran like a a shield deck with spider woman i think that yeah that was a leadership justice which was a really slow deck, a really, uh, but like once it got up and running, it was a good time. I think I think there's kind of two conversations we can have around this. We can have a Web Warrior conversation, and I want to do that. But also, Spider Woman has some crazy new potentials. Just every single time a new card gets printed, it changes Spider Woman. So, do I want to let's uh, let's talk about Spider Woman first, and we'll touch on Web Warriors. Yeah. So Spider Woman is one of my favorites in all honesty and she's one of those characters that i used to consider captain america stronger than her but she just has so many amazing combos and is very powerful in her own right i would put her up there in the conversation you know as one of the strongest characters in the game <clears throat> and she just has so many new combos there's just new combos of every pack one little thing that can interact with something else and i think that is extremely cool i really like that um, one of the decks I did after Phoenix came out was to put Pinned Down in Spider Woman and then combine it with the aggression stuff that benefits from minions. So you can kind of keep hold of the minions, then do, you know, minion stuff. But, you know, shield, you know, yeah, just, just getting <laughs> Maria Hill or in a shield build is uh, quite useful, we shall say. So she's yeah. got a lot of really cool combos, you know, more than I could really name. I feel like we could do a whole episode on Spider Woman, which is yeah. a testament to how cool she is. So has she got better? Yes. Was she already really <laughs> good? Yes. Is yeah. she going to keep getting better and new stuff? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I guess like we don't have it yet as of the recording or probably the publication of this episode, but Deadpool is coming with a new aspect. And so we have the pool aspect. So she can take cards from that pool aspect and pair them with a separate aspect as well potentially getting her up to you know five aspects played in a single turn which would be i think you know a fun challenge to try and beat but what what do you i guess touch on the pool aspect for us real real quick before we uh talk a little bit more about the the, the web warrior friends now we don't have the full rules i believe for deadpool at least not officially i don't know if you're going to have to include the downside of taking the pool aspect, which if you don't know, is you, you must get like a second Shadow of the Past kind of style card, which will bring in a uh, dread pool into play as sort of a <laughs> second nemesis. And I don't know if taking it as another aspect card is going to bring that in because that will be kind of a downside. But on the flip side, there are a lot of cool cards in the Deadpool, uh, the, the pool aspect. And uh, I think there are going to be some really, really unique combinations, especially with the allies, because you can get these allies from the pool aspect, which so far don't appear to have any consequential damage on them, and then take all the leadership readying stuff or upgrades on them. And I think that is what I am perhaps most interested in as a deck builder to look at first with her. Yeah. 
Yeah. I yeah, Spider Woman just continues to get better and better. There's more interactions. You can take the best of the new aspect cards and find just some really unique combinations that really you can only get with Spider Woman, maybe Adam, a couple of these multi aspect heroes, but there there's just some really fun interactions. I I guess like one more question, just because I love Spider Woman. What what has been your favorite cross aspect interaction? with spider woman Ooh, putting me on the spot what is my favorite cross aspect interaction you know there's so many interesting ones so i would have to say and we definitely did not pause for a couple minutes while i went back into <laughs> my recent spider woman decks uh, i actually have a few favorite interactions and i want to quickly shout out a deck i made called card Dracula, which was a halloween deck and oh okay yeah, that uses, um, I, I punched that, you know, last October, and it uses pinned down, which I sort of was just talking about, you know, to hold a minion still, and then you just bring it to draw cards from them, you know, it's like you're, you're drinking the cards from their veins or something. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I really enjoyed that kind of thing. But one of the ones I worked on and, you know, never posted, but there's an ally called Bishop that came out not too long ago i mean in the in the general release cycle it was a few months ago now and bishop is after he, you know an attack comes toward you you um after an enemy attacks you place an energy counter on him and each one of those basically equals plus two attack when he then attacks and spider woman can take bait and switch but now she can take taunt to kind of charge up bishop which mm. i think is fun and that is fun the other side of the angle that comes with is, you know, your justice and, uh, you know, protection. You can go Ultra Ego with Confuses, with, you know, Pheromones or whatever. And because you have Taunt, you can still trigger Unflappable when, you know, flip yeah. back down that turn. So that's some kind of cool stuff going on there. Um, there's a bunch more I could talk about, but I'll probably leave it with those two. Nice. Yeah. Spider Woman is just one of those heroes that fascinates me from a deck building perspective. She also has Spider in her title, which Spider-Man does as well. We got a whole slew of web warriors and Spider-Man and all of that kind of, I was going to say nonsense, but I actually love them. So they're not nonsense. Uh, all of that kind of stuff in the Sinister Motives wave. We got a card called Warrior of the Great Web, which you can attach to a character with Spider in the title and give them the web warrior trait. Do you run this with the Spider-Man, Spider-Woman, or is it... I found it to be a lot of setup for not a ton of benefit, so I'm curious what you think here. I think the Web Warrior stuff is very powerful, and I run it a lot in Spider-Man. I do not run it a lot in Spider-Woman. I have used it in her, but it's quite a bit of setup, so while I have had good results... I have good results with Spider-Woman kind of all the time, yeah. if I'm honest. So I don't love it in Spider-Woman, though I think it is fun to do as like, you know, an occasional thing. But for Spider-Man, I think it is, I'm going to say transformational. I think if it wasn't for the Web Warrior and also genius stuff, I think Spider-Man would have fallen off a little bit. I have mm -hmm. a lot of success with Spider-Man and I definitely think maybe it's a little bit better in multiplayer. You know, if you play him in protection, you can play Silk, Spider-Man, Noir, um, Web of Life and Destiny, and also War of the Great Web. That's four different ways to unlock your ability to play all the rest of the Web Warrior cards. But mm -hmm. I don't tend to like playing Spider-Man in protection in solo play because his fording is practically non-existent. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, that is a, a, a thing there. But I've enjoyed it in Justice, you know, Justice card draw to find those pieces to play them. I do really, really like it in Spider-Man. Yeah. Uh, so so I have two points and your job is to remind me that I have two points if I go off on a tangent. But Spider-Woman for me, I played a Warrior the Great Web Spider-Woman deck which I don't remember the aspects. I assume it was just as protection just because that's where all the web warriors like to live. But Warrior the Great Web also gives you a plus one attack whenever a spider leaves play. And so that's that is cumulative, correct? Like, if you have multiple spiders leave play? Yep. Yeah. And so I was taking um, bait and switch and other ways to make them attack me. And so I was using chump blockers. And then I was using, like, rapid response to make the call to bring them back. 
And so they were attacking. I was getting a card draw from Web of Life and Destiny, plus one attack. Spider-Woman gets plus to her stats whenever she's playing aspect cards. And I was getting that attack really, really high. And I think it was a fun way to play. That's my favorite way that I've played Spider-Woman in the Web Warrior build. Um, but I agree. I think Spider-Man uh, has a little bit more fun with the, the, the Spider-Heroes, or the Spider-Allies, I should say. When... The other thing that I've really enjoyed, and this is my second point I remembered, is I just played Taunts with Spider-Man, which is just so much fun. Uh, his ability to draw a card, so now Taunt is netting you two cards rather than just one card. You pay two resources, or I guess two resources, I should say. You pay two resources, fill and attacks you, you get three resources back. And Spider-Man gets that card draw, you're getting to see just so many cards, and you just have... So I had so much fun with with Taunt and Spider Man. That that's a that's a fun combo there. Yeah, I've actually messed around with a couple of decks with that. I think the challenge has been trying to draw cards that are then useful. But you drawing so many cards, it's really satisfying. You know, play this card. Suddenly, four new cards are in your hand. That is, yeah, you know, it's kind of like a Nick Fury in a way. Even even yeah. one extra card, it's uh, it's a lot of fun to do that. So that is really cool. Um, the other thing for Spider-Man I think we should probably talk about is the genius kind of trait he has mm -hmm. with Ingenuity and Moon Girl. And those things also yeah. affect a couple of other Avengers like Iron Man and Wasp. So have you been using those cards since they came out with those characters? Have they been any good? I, I have I've played Moon Girl with Spider-Man. I have played Ingenuity with uh, Spider-Man and Iron Man. I really haven't played a lot of Wasp recently. I, I need to revisit Wasp, but... For for some reason, I'm not playing a ton of Moon Girl with Spider Man, because I think I live with protection in Spider Man, and protection does not always want to be going down to alter ego. So I can justify going down to get that resource generator, that efficient resource generator. But I don't want to go flip down every single time that I'm getting a Moon Girl. That being said, Iron Man, on the other hand, I want that resource generator. He's spending a lot of time in alter ego. I feel like. That Ingenuity Moon Girl works really, really well with uh, Tony. And yeah, Wasp, I think I think Wasp has gotten a pretty big boost. Um, before, well, Actually, before we talk about Wasp and, and like everything that she's gotten, just because we have a lot of mental resources now, uh, Genius, Ingenuity, that kind of stuff with Iron Man, Spider-Man from the expert deck builder perspective. I really like those cards. Um... Both characters, all three characters. I really want to talk about Wasp. Um, yeah. Now, getting Ultra Ego with Spider Man is interesting. Some builds like it, some builds don't. I don't think he naturally likes it, I agree. But what I really like about Moon Girl with Spider Man is he has his scientist ability in Ultra Ego that generates a mental resource. So he's actually always able to get some good card draw off Moon Girl, no matter kind of what he draws in his hand around her, because she's an ally that for every mental resource you pay for her with, she draws you a card. And I like card draw, so I've really enjoyed that. <laughs> and again, Iron Man, yeah, card draw is really good for him. And something about Iron Man I want to talk about, it's not directly related, but we talked about superpower training before. You can use that to find his signature upgrades, you know, for tech pieces. Maybe Arc mm -hmm. Reactor is probably the, you know, best one. So that's really cool. But yeah, he has, uh, you know, he always wants mental resources because he wants to go aerial with his rocket boots. So getting ingenuity to secure that, it's kind of, it's cheaper than Quinn Carrier, but you can also run Quinn Carrier and, you know, kind of have different ways to get it then. So yeah, big fan of that. And I think it has helped both of them. Iron Man, gonna, I don't know if I want to transition to Wasp and talk about Genius or talk about Iron Man and talk about tech, but he's got Force Fluid Generator. That's another tech option for him, but also Repurpose, which I think has been yeah. really fun for Iron Man. Yeah. Yeah, repurpose, being able to discard any of those tech cards, readying up, getting a plus to those stats, just took Iron Man to another level. And he has tech in his kit. He has tech with Force Field Generator. Energy Barrier came out in the Miss Marvel pack. What, what a strange pack for that to come in. Um, <laughs> but what a strange uh, pre confirmed Miss Marvel to come with. <laughs> yeah, right. But uh, he has ways and just. That gets a plus to his hand size. Then once you have an excess of seven, you can repurpose those off and just clear that villain. I mean, it's a very fast, very efficient build with Iron Man. But I, I'm kind of curious about Wasp. Let's dive into Wasp. What I need to say about Wasp is her alter ego ability is to shuffle mental resources, you know, mental resource cards back into her deck. So Professor X is one of those, which is a 
huge boost, you know, you to get Professor X more often. And there's a really cool deck that Team Canada Hockey 2002 posted called The Girl in Cerebro. And Girl is kind of, you know, the acronym that is Wasp's um, Alter Ego ability. And this deck is all about cheating in Cerebro, which you can do with the new build support player side scheme. It puts cards into place, so it bypasses the traits. So Wasp can get Cerebro, then can, she can use her Alter Ego ability to keep shuffling <laughs> Professor X back in, you know, kind of as, as if you were Psylocke, like we talked about in the previous episode, which I think is really fun. Um, you know, yeah. I don't know if that's, you know, quote unquote optimal, but it's certainly viable. It certainly looks very fun. Um, so I've not tried that myself, but it's very, very cool. I wanted to shout that out. Moon Girl, I also really like for that purpose. I just think Moon Girl is so strong. You know, you can shuffle her back into your deck when you go Alter Ego. And then when you are Alter Ego, you can play her for massive card draw. And if you flip down at the right time with not many cards left, you can guarantee shuffling Moon Girl back into your deck and then still being Alter Ego when you start your next turn. Drawing those cards, guaranteeing drawing Moon Girl and then playing her and yeah, just drawing cards, drawing cards, very good in card game. Um, yep. <laughs> and that is what I think is the main kind of thing that has boosted Wasp in my opinion. She's definitely got help here and there from other ways, other little cards and things. But for me, she really just needs money. And I actually think Clarity of Purpose helps her a lot. So she mm-hmm. may have somewhat mm-hmm. expensive cards. And then she's got all these cool mental resources, you know, resource cards that she can do a lot with. Yeah, they, the number of mental resources that we have in every single aspect to shuffle in just increases her flexibility, which I also think is really important in Marvel Champions. If you want, you can throw Professor X or Nick back in, but if you need another melee or something, you're running a Hone Technique build with Wasp, which I think is another shout to what she can do because she wants to be running those mental resources. If you're on minion control, you can shuffle those melees back in and just hit those multiple times, multiple times every single uh, turn or every single game, every single deck pass. That's the word I'm looking for. Wow. And that is just another way. The more we print mental resources, the more options Wasp has, which inherently makes her a stronger hero. Yeah, that home technique shot is really good. You know, Wasp is really an interesting kind of all-rounder that can kind of do what she needs in any aspect. Although I do, I do lean toward leadership personally. But yeah, yeah, that's that's very fun. Uh, Wasp is Wasp is a character that when I started playing the game, I considered to be a bottom ten character. And mm. while I don't think, for me personally, I think I think you have her rated higher. But well, for me personally, while she hasn't, she hasn't really leapt up the tier list, but I don't think any character has too much, you know, made any significant jumps with new cards, but they've definitely become stronger within reason. But mm. Wasp has actually done really well. I think all these new cards, and you know, we're talking about all these new mental resource, you know, cards. For some reason, every card that has a mental resource in the corner tends to be really powerful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, all the powerful cards in leadership just tend to have a uh, mental resource. And even in the other aspects and, you know, basic, it's definitely uh, a good resource type to have in your corner if you're a card. And there are more Avengers we can talk about, but I think maybe we should move on to something a little scarier. All righty. Let's, uh, let's talk about Halloween scenarios. So we've kind of each come up with a scenario that we want to just kind of throw out there, thematic scenario to take on and kind of get into that spooky season villain. What is your go-to or your recommendation for a Halloween spooky scenario? So I actually think Marvel Champions really lends itself to a lot of spooky scenarios. You know, a lot of villains are just basically people in Halloween costumes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but I wanted to try and bring one of the new scenarios into it. So I've gone for a bit of a horror theme, you know, kind of directly here, I would say. So I want to say my combination, you know, my Halloween scenario of choice that I'm looking forward to try is going to be Morlock Siege with the horror modular from nice. Mojo Mania and Beastie Boys from The Hood. So Morlock Siege is all about protecting your Morlocks, but the horror modular introduces a couple of really nasty things you know in addition to the theme of horror the environment card gives the enemies quick strike which is going to put your little morlocks in trouble and yeah. you've also got the werewolf pack card which just eats an ally so if your only allies are the morlocks they are just one of them is getting <laughs> devoured <laughs> just outright yeah. getting destroyed which i think is uh really going to feel like you know you're being they're being hunted down and in danger nice i like that i really like the horror mod i really enjoy all those mojo mods 
I think they're all really fun. That's cool. Okay, so it's knocking or I it's more like siege. I'm thinking of knock knock. Like that almost is like a horror feel as well. Like someone's yeah. at the door. It's like, oh <laughs> <laughs> a werewolf. Oh no. Uh okay, that's cool. I, I went in a kind of a dress up type theme. And so the the thought here is we're gonna be playing Mysterio, who comes with personal nightmare which is kind of that creepy like how are we going to do fool's paradise type thing where he's shuffling cards into your deck so he's masquerading as your cards and then we are going to take the cosmic entities which are not good cards and this is not my idea this is josh from get up and game he came up with this idea and we played it on the channel but using that to shuffle into mysterio's deck so we're masquerading some player cards as encounter cards as well and so those go into the deck it's set up as part of the mod set. And then to get the pumpkin theme, we're going to go with goblin gimmicks to get all those pumpkin bombs to give to Mysterio. Um, and if you wanted to even make it scarier for some reason, and this is more of a meta scary, we can choose either telepathy or flight for Mysterio and add that into that, and that's not that's not a theme scary. That's just a okay. This is going to get more challenging scary. So that's the challenge mode. But Mysterio, kind of with all of his stuff, but masquerading cards. We're putting our cards in his deck. He's putting his cards in our deck, and they're dressing up as each other. That's kind of the route that I went. That is really cool. I really like that. <laughs> and yeah, shout out to Josh. That was, that was such a cool idea. And I like what you say about adding, you know, telepathy or air. Or you know, if Mysterio is flying toward me, I'm probably going to be more scared. But if Mysterio <laughs> Is reading my mind with telepathy or something and then messing yeah. with me? That is scary. So that's kind of, uh, that's cool as well. I like, I like the using the, you know, the uh, cosmic entity cards in an interesting way because those are definitely gathering a lot of dust in my card collection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is, which is so sad. Just so sad that that would be, uh, that'd be a fun discussion to talk about cosmic entities. But let's, uh, let's transition to some community questions. And remember, if you have a question that you want us to, talk about go ahead and send us an email at shadow of the cast at gmail.com or if you're watching this on youtube drop it in the comments and we'd be happy but the we'll be happy to uh talk about it but i think our first question i want to go from night of the living card game hey nelson and villa theory long time listener here so that's exciting we have long time listeners already i have a question for you about player side schemes i've heard a lot of people talk about how almost all the player side schemes are incredibly strong and great value for the cost did the designers make this the first wave quote too good when the next wave of them comes out are they going to be outclassed by the first wave or will it lead to power creep and player side schemes that take the, even the newer ones that is almost unfair so what are, what are your what are our thoughts around player side schemes? And we may have already talked about this at some point in our in our in our lives. <laughs> it's really interesting. I know we talked before player side schemes came out, and there were some worries they were going to be too good. But I think they've ended up in a relatively good spot overall. You know, actually, you know, we talked about Ant Man with Superpower Training briefly earlier, and I actually had a couple of games where I found the side scheme before my helmet. My helmet, in both cases, somehow was the last card in my deck. And managed to fish his helmet out a lot quicker. But I could just as easily have found Ant-Man's helmet. And to be honest with you, Ant-Man doesn't have a lot of threat removal. I probably would rather have just played the helmet, or at least it would have been, you know, an interesting decision to make depending on the situation. So I think in some regard, and I didn't air this, you know, originally, it's not my strictly an original thought, but I do agree with it wholeheartedly, is that something that player side schemes do is they make things that could already naturally happen more consistent. Like, I could have found the mm. helmet then, but instead I found the side scheme. So I still get the helmet, but it could have just been another copy of the helmet as such. So if I had good luck, I, you know, the player side scheme wouldn't really make any difference. But since I had bad luck, it actually really helped. So I think in having more consistent results, you know, now someone's sort of talking about how modern heroes tend to find their key pieces, where I think that helps old heroes. And, you know, heroes that do have this one thing they're looking for in particular, to, and, you know, that can help with aspect cards with maybe build support that can make some kind of build that is kind of unreliable unless you find a specific card more reliable because you have another way to find it. So I think that's a huge benefit, and I don't think it's too strong. They definitely are strong, though. They're not game-breaking in any way, even though they are very helpful. That is my opinion. Do you share that opinion, Nelson, or do you feel differently? 
Yeah, I, th I think so. I think we, you know, we have a whole deck building video on my channel where we talked about player side schemes and kind of the efficiency of them based on player count and all of that. I think in solo, I've kind of landed on they they are good. They they are good cards to have. I mean, the worst case scenario is you throw them out and they sit there, right? You they don't have negative benefits for the ones that we've seen or the ones that we have so far. We've seen some with some negative stuff and. So with that, like, I think, you know, the worst case is that they're a neutral card. Best case is what you were talking about, and they smooth out that rounding, or they smooth out that curve. And I think player side schemes in multiplayer are really good and just dynamically change the game. And I have found myself running decks with them. I have found myself running decks without them, which is right where I want the, some of the cards to be. And so I, when I initially saw them, I was like, I don't see myself ever running a deck without build support. But now, like after playing, I don't know, however many games I've played since Size Games have come out, they're making it into, I don't know, 60% of my games or so. And I feel like that's a really healthy space to be in because they are not as powerful as I was kind of expecting them to be, but they are still really, really strong and always a deck building consideration. So I'm really happy with where the power level uh kind of normalized too in my mind yeah the the only one i think that could be argued to be too strong maybe it's cool for backup because allies good. allies, <laughs> allies good <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i don't think they've backed themselves into a corner i don't think the newer ones will be you know too good that it's unfair i think they have to be careful not to have too many ways to get things in conveniently but i think player side schemes can do so many interesting things they have a lot of room to explore still yeah yeah, absolutely. I'm going to go ahead and pick a different question. And I think this is actually a really useful, practical question from Julio. And they say, do you guys have any tricks or methods you use to remember certain things? I don't know how many times I've forgotten to remember the villain has, you know, gained retaliate or forgot to do the when defeated action after defeating a side scheme. Any advice? Oh my goodness. I am, I sympathize so much with Julio right here. I, I like, this is me. This is me. So what I have done is I went out and I bought by the same token tokens that have like when defeated and I placed those on the cards or I have retaliate tokens where I'll place that, but I will still forget them. And, you know, I, I am lucky that I have a chat that will yell at me and help me remember, but it is, I think, a hard part about the game. It, there's, there's a lot going on and there's just, you know, things will get missed. And so... I use the tokens. Sometimes I will read out the card because another thing that I have fallen into, fallen into the trap of, is trying to memorize the cards and then playing those cards with my memorization, not necessarily what the card actually says. And so I, I've been trying to be a little bit more methodical of reading that card and not just like, oh, I know what Army of Ants does. But I will say that those tokens have really helped. That's really interesting because I don't really have tokens in the same way as Nelson. I mostly use, you know, the original stuff. I do have a couple of tokens now, but I think tokens in general are a good move. I think if you don't have, you know, additional tokens, you can just put a generic, you know, one counter onto a side scheme or onto a, you know, a minion as a when defeated. And when you go to move it or maybe remove it or, you know, something like that, you're going to see this counter and you're going to be like, what was this there for? And that can be just... <laughs> That could be a reminder to be like, maybe I should read this card because <laughs> yeah. <laughs> reading the cards, you know, there was a point in time where I considered myself to have, you know, maybe a bit arrogant, you know, but like, like a borderline encyclopedic kind of knowledge. I feel like I knew almost everything, but three or so more expansions later and, you know, over a dozen more heroes later, there is so much to keep track of in this game. And you can, you know, even if you're playing a big variety of heroes and things, or, you know, variety of villains, there are so many cards that it's hard to remember them all. And one one thing that's worse than some, you know, something that can be worse than forgetting something on a card is remembering it inaccurately and doing something else entirely. So yeah. yeah, counters I think are you know one of the best moves. Something that I struggle to remember is a card I really like called Assess the Situation. And the amount of times I played this and then not got the bigger hand size, I don't want to talk about. But <laughs> <laughs> I've ended up putting like just a counter on my deck. And if I've, you know, played two of them, I'll play two, you know, of the generic one counters on my deck to remember how much to draw. Because next time I go to draw from my deck, I'm going to see them. So yeah, yeah. put counters down, 
read, 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 and uh, <laughs> you'll probably still make mistakes because this game has a lot going on. <laughs> yeah. Nice. And our last question that we're going to be talking about is actually going to be a reoccurring question. This is from Frederick, and Frederick suggested that we talk about what we're playing this week and maybe even kind of talk about what's coming up on our respective YouTube channels. And so this is going to be kind of a reoccurring thing that we're going to add into each one of these episodes. What are we planning on playing? What are some of the new things coming out? So, Villain, I'm going to tee that up for you. What are you playing slash what are you working on for YouTube? That is a great question, because I've now got to figure out when this episode is going to come out and what's going to be <laughs> available for people. But I have just, as we're starting to record this, um, I'm posting an Angel review and a Psylog review, and I'm going to be working on a uh, kind of a, a guide of sorts to aggression and its different archetypes and things, different things you can do within that aspect in quite a detailed way. So that's coming up on my YouTube channel. But in terms of playing... Uh, I'm going to continue playing that campaign with Spectrum and Psylog, where we're going through. It's actually Mad Titan's Shadow. I'm really excited to finish that. That's been a lot of fun because I don't often play in campaign mode, but you know, my friend suggested it, and I thought that sounded really, really cool. And something I haven't talked to Nelson about, and this is not strictly Marvel Champions, but I may or may not have just come into possession of Spirit Island. So I'm going to be nice. to playing that. Yeah, nice. That's amazing. That's I. Uh, that's my favorite game of all time. So. I hope you absolutely love that. Nice. Cool. I am so I I am actually not going to have too too much time to play games because at the time that this airs, I think I will be out of the country or just coming back from being out of the country. Um and so I will be at least thinking about uh some of the new cards with old heroes and I've been really enjoying revisiting some of these old heroes with some of the new cards. One of the decks that I played the other day that I just absolutely loved and which I think we'll be posting probably around the same time as this uh, this podcast when it comes out is I built a Spider-Ham Taunt deck where I was toying with the villain, but we did get up to plus 100 cards drawn with that deck. And so it, it was, it, it gets crazy. It was fun. I had my max in one round was 31 cards drawn. That does not include the starting opening hand or anything like that. It, It's just like there are some fun interactions there. And so I keep going back and trying to find ways to exploit some of these new cards with older heroes. Um, with the YouTube channel, I have a lot of playthroughs coming out. And then the I guess that's always happening. I am working on Nebula and Vision, the Hero Spotlight videos. I need to work on some of those. Those should be coming out in the next couple of weeks. And then I kind of forgot about my protection archetype video. I did the first three at the beginning of this year. And then I think I went on vacation or something, kind of forgot about protection. So I am working on for getting the protection archetype out video out in the next like month or so. But that's kind of what's coming up for me. I can't stop thinking about Spider Ham drawing 31 cards in a turn. <laughs> what a weak hero. <laughs> he, 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 he was about, bad. Hmm. He was bad. <laughs> Cannot wait to talk about, about him in an episode. But yeah, that's really cool. I'm really excited to uh, see the results of that. Nebula, one of my favorite heroes. So that'll be cool. I'll definitely be watching that. And nice. I think that just about does it for this episode. Um, thank you all for joining us. I do want to say next time in a couple of weeks, we're actually going to be looking back at another trait, you know, uh, another tribe, if you will, another faction. And we're going to be looking at the Guardians who, outside of the, you know, card game in terms of the MCU, they are my favorite kind of group, I would say. I really love yeah. the Guardians. You know, sci-fi, comedy, you know, retro music. That is everything I love. And I always get enthusiastic, you know, playing those characters in the game. So I'm I'm very excited for that. Nice. Awesome. So, yeah, remember to send in your questions on either the YouTube or shadowofthecast at gmail.com. And thank you all for listening, and we'll catch you next time. See you. Bye. Bye.